we have, of course, um, Dr. Uliana Suprun and Andy Hunder today. We will try to establish, uh, not maybe establish with any certainty, but at least ask um, ourselves questions. What's the cost uh, of this pandemic to Ukraine? What are the possible ways out? Um, which areas will be the most affected? And what do we have to do? What does Ukraine have to do in terms of uh, good preparation and solid policy uh, in order to minimize that cost? Um, and the cost, uh, we're talking about the cost to human lives and cost to the economy, of course. We're talking about two costs. Um, and um, now we, can, we have uh, Ulena Suprun and Andy Hunder on video. So welcome to you both. Thank you again very much for finding time tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so could you could you tell us uh, briefly what is the main topic you want to focus on today uh, in today's webinar which by the way will will um, finish in one hour so we have to be brief. Thank you. Um, my main focus will be the um, human cost of the COVID-19 um, fight against the COVID-19 and the costs in Ukraine. Yeah. Uh, and I think the topic is uh, sort of how battered and bruised will Ukraine come out post COVID-19, but I will focus more on the economic and the, the, the business uh, side of things. Uh, both Andy and uh, Pani Ulana are supporting the charity called Patients of Ukraine. Uh, I hope that colleagues from Ukrainian Institute can put them in the group chat, the links to uh, donate to support this charity. Uh, so please uh, open group chat, uh, dear audience, and you will see the essential links. Uh, we're also asked to um, donate if you can afford um, about five pounds suggested donation for the upkeep of this Zoom membership for Ukrainian Institute, uh, which is also a charity. Um, and um, we hope to be able to ask some audience's questions uh, to Pani Ulana and um, Andy in about half an hour. Um, meanwhile, uh, it would be a sin not to ask Dr. Suprun for some tips. So um, we all either are scared to get COVID-19, or we have symptoms of COVID-19, or we imagine we have symptoms of COVID-19. In either way, you know, we need information. There is lots of information, some of which is proven, some of which is unproven. I've spent a lot of time reading the uh, medical magazines like Lancet, because otherwise you can't really understand anything from the news. So um, give us some tips. I've got some props here. So over the last weeks, I heard that if you have symptoms, of COVID-19 or, or if, you know, one of your um, uh, close people who live with you have symptoms, you have to do the following. You can either wash your hands, with some soap for 20 seconds. Um, you can eat a lot of garlic or onion, traditional Ukrainian uh, remedies. Ginger, of course, that um, the, the price of which skyrocketed in Ukraine because it's believed to be a magical cure for COVID-19. Vitamin C which is illustrated here by a kiwi and, and an orange. And of course, wiping surfaces with a good antiseptic. And if you feel sick, the UK physicians recommend a little bit of paracetamol and a nice cup of tea um, and rest. So, Pani Supron, which of these uh, remedies would you recommend? Well, first of all, um, I hope that all of us are healthy. Those of you that do have symptoms should get in touch with your physician and talk to them about what you should do next. Some of those who have symptoms can stay at home. Others need to be in the hospital and please do be in touch with your primary care physicians. That's the most important thing that we should do. The, the best way to protect yourself from becoming sick um, is to wash your hands and you can wash your hands with soap. That's the best way to do it or you can wash your hands and you can wash surfaces with the um, alcohol, at least 67% of alcohol in any kind of a cleanser. The other things you showed, paracetamol helps with bringing down fever, aches and pains. Right now that is the only approved um, treatment for COVID-19 because uh, no antibiotics and no other medicines have yet been approved that they show that they really help with uh, decreasing the uh, length of time of illness as well as decreasing the symptoms. Now many of the other things you showed may help us feel better in some way 
as we all talk about, we talk about social or physical distancing, at least two meters apart between people. So apparently the garlic and the onion may help with that because people may not want to sit right next to you. And they do have vitamin C as have the other uh, um, fruits that you showed us. And vitamin C can help in strengthening uh, because uh, a lack of vitamin C can cause a problem with uh, immunodeficiency. Eating um, anything with vitamin C, of course, is healthy. Fresh fruits and vegetables are the best kinds of things that you can eat to keep your immune system healthy. However, none of those treats the disease. Again, the best way to protect yourself is to wash your hands, to follow the instructions of your government or your ministry of health, um, to keep a two meter distance between yourself and other people if you are standing anywhere uh, amongst people that you are unaware of, um, who, wh what their condition is, and to make sure that you're safe by um, having all of the surfaces cleaned with antiseptic. That's really the best thing that we can do for ourselves right now. Okay, so uh, out of all my probes, these win, paracetamol, soap, and antiseptic, these are That's the correct. approved uh, ways of combating or at least protecting uh, yourself in this pandemic. Um, I was also interested personally, so we, we know why uh, soap and why antiseptic, because they dissolve this uh, lipid um, surface the, of the virus. The wall, correct. The yeah, cells so wall. there's a bit of a, like a fatty, fatty kind of protection on the virus, and we need to dissolve that fat, and that's why soap is is best, and not just some, you know, non-soap kind of organic, uh, you know, thing. Um, but uh, wh what's a virus load? So we see a lot of doctors getting sick, uh, seriously sick. Does it matter how many of the viruses you? you get that's something that puzzles me if you get like 300 viruses versus three viruses does it matter so does it matter uh, maybe social maybe that's why social distancing is important if you those people who have a constant and a lot of contact with others, especially those who may very well have uh, the virus, which is um, healthcare workers, they get a lot of exposure and our immune system can fight off the virus up to a certain point before it gets overwhelmed with how much virus there is and it can't fight it off anymore. And that's why those people who are either healthcare workers, uh, those people who um, uh, have a lot of customers, say in a post office or in a bank, um, even in Ukraine, they have um, those that are working in grocery stores. They wear masks, not only to protect their customers, but also to protect themselves so that the virus load is less coming into them. That's also why we need to wash our hands. We need to wash our hands because as we touch surfaces that somebody coughed and the uh, droplets from their cough may have landed on a surface. If we touch it and touch our eyes, our nose, or our mouth, that's the entry point for the virus. And if there's a big enough virus load because there's a lot of the virus on the surface that we touch, it overwhelms our immune system. And that's why we talk about the virus load. Um, in Ukraine, there is actually a very high number of uh, a high percentage of medical workers that have tested positive for the SARS-CoV-2 virus, because there are two ways we talk about testing. The testing actually tests for the virus itself. Those are the uh, PCR tests, the ones where they take a swab from your nose or your throat. So it actually looks for parts of the virus. And that only means that the virus is present inside the person. However, having symptoms then uh, is um, uh, equal to having COVID-19, which is the disease caused by the virus. And a similar comparison is people may be positive for HIV, in other words, have an HIV virus. However, they may not have AIDS or the disease that the HIV virus causes. Similar with uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus and the COVID-19 disease. So many healthcare workers in Ukraine, up to 15% of those who have tested positive are actually healthcare workers. And the problem here is number one, as there was a problem in most of the world, the uh, personal protective equipment was not as available as we would have liked it to be. Not enough planning was done so that it was available. A second part is that in Ukraine, there hasn't been a great deal of training for the medical personnel on how to use this equipment and when to use this equipment. Third is there's an unfortunately left over legacy culture from the Soviet times that medical workers are taught to use the least amount of equipment possible to not mm, have too much financing uh, used for this kind of equipment for themselves. The healthcare workers were not treated as the um, highest priority of the healthcare system as we are changing that now. 
um, with the healthcare reform. And then the last is in the beginning, the WHO uh, put, um, uh, put out a recommendation that if somebody tested positive for influenza, for the flu, then they, the symptoms that they were having must be from the flu and they didn't go further and test for, for uh, the SARS virus or the COVID-19. What ended up happening is a couple of uh, outbreaks amongst the healthcare personnel happened because one of the healthcare workers tested, had symptoms, tested positive for influenza, and they didn't go further on WHO recommendations, and that person ended up infecting a lot of others, especially the healthcare workers. So in Ukraine, we're very um, aware of the fact that um, without the healthcare workers, we won't be able to treat the disease um, if we have an overwhelming number of patients, and now there's been quite a change in the amount of PPE available, much of it due to organizations like Patients of Ukraine, um, which uh, charity organizations and business that has been helping them, um, unfortunately, rather than the government um, kicking in. We've heard from the president about a lot of planes full of equipment coming from China and from other countries, but there's no transparency in reporting where that equipment is going and who is it helping. And it's created quite a difficult problem in coordinating the civil society and business response to helping those 242 hospitals who have been designated the first line hospitals in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, thank you, Dr. Suprun. Um, I'm under orders to also mention um, that you are the founder of the School of Rehabilitation Medicine at the Ukrainian Catholic University and a good friend of the Ukrainian Catholic University, which is, of course, affiliated with the Ukrainian Institute in London. Uh, and I'm yes, also, also currently um, I'm head of an, a new NGO called RQA, which is an analytical center, analyze research and create solutions for the problems and the issues that are in, currently in Ukraine. Thank you. And um, Andy is, of course, the uh, head of the American Chamber of Commerce in Ukraine. I think um, our audience probably knows you so well that uh, I, you know, I forgot even to say this. Uh, but uh, speaking about the audience, we have about 150 people now listening to us. And um, another thing that um, I have to do is I have to launch a poll. So can the audience please go to the chat uh, function um, and they will see a poll uh, which will ask where they are listening from. Oh, th there you go. There you go. So uh, colleagues from Ukrainian Institute um, have just uh, popped it up. So I'm, of course, listening and talking from London. Um, but panelists and hosts cannot vote, so okay, I, I'm, I'm not allowed to vote. But uh, all the audience uh, can vote, so please vote, and the Ukrainian Institute will then know where our audience comes from, and uh, of course that will help uh, determine the, uh, the best topics to bring to your attention. And another thing that um, I am under orders to announce is the next event uh, on the 4th of May, I think Marina will also talk, tell us a little bit uh, in the end of the seminar. Don't mention the war. Monday 1st, 4th of May, 6 p.m. Does Europe have need a shared historical narrative of World War II? And the uh, guest for that one will be Sergei Plochy, the historian, also well known to our audience. Um, and Brendan Sims uh, from the University of Cambridge, where he accidentally was my... Uh, supervisor and the moderator will be Adrian Karetnitsky. So, ah, we have the uh, poll uh, for now. So, UK is most. <laughs> Hopefully, it's not. Uh, it's not just because of Ukrainian Institute, uh, but because we have such a such an active diaspora here. Ukraine is second with 21%. Then USA is 11%. Canada, EU, uh, which until recently included us here in the UK, 7%, and other. 4%. Uh, thank you very much for this. It's very interesting to know. Um, Ukrainian Institute in London, of course, is a charity and it's very grateful for donations to upkeep Zoom membership and other uh, things like that. Now, uh, we'll probably uh, continue the conversation about the medical, the healthcare reform with Dr. Supun in a couple of minutes, but let's turn to Andy and ask about the economic, um, the economic co well, cost and the, and the um, and the projections. So the recent IMF projections were of a GDP contraction of about 7.7% .7 of GDP for this year, and then a recovery of, I think, four, four something percent. There are different forecasts. Of course, it's impossible to forecast such a thing because it all depends on the length of, um, of the quarantine measures. Um, and we will talk about the, the, those measures with Dr. Suprun in a minute. But Andy, can you tell us where the, where the weaknesses lie and which sectors which, and which areas of Ukrainian economy need support or maybe need uh, uh, policies or better organization or better 
uh, coordination. Um, well, thank you, Svetlana, and uh, congratulations on your appointment as the, one of the trustees of the Ukrainian Institute. Uh, Ukrainian you. Institute is, uh, as you know, something very close to my heart, and I'm absolutely delighted for it. And uh, I'm always delighted to be on a panel with uh, Ulyana. Uh, our members are very fond of her, and um, our Thanksgiving awards two years ago went to Ulyana because the members are very grateful for all that she's done here in Ukraine, especially for the healthcare reform. Um, in terms of the, um, the impact we, this, um, the COVID-19 will have on the Ukraine's economy, um, this is uh, the third crisis, the economic crisis that I've seen, I'm seeing in Ukraine for just over 10 years. So if we look back at 2009 uh, and then 2014, 15 and 2020, so the, the impact in 2009, it was uh, about 15% hit on the GDP. Uh, then in uh, 2014 and 15, uh, we saw contraction of about 16.4% 16, 16 uh, over the, the two years. And now the projections or scenario, one of the scenarios is looking at about 7.7%. Uh, so some would argue that Ukraine is actually better prepared for this crisis than it was in the previous two. Um, in terms of some sectors that we can definitely see are better prepared, uh, the banking sector, uh, compared to where we were uh, both uh, six years ago or just over 10 years ago. I think the banking sector is, is looking pretty healthy at the moment. However, what would need to happen to make sure that Ukraine goes through its much more smoothly is a massive decision that still needs to be made by Ukraine's parliament to vote for uh, a law that the International Monetary Fund requires for Ukraine to receive um, just over $8 billion. Um, this is part of the IMF program. There's a five and a half billion plus an additional uh, couple of billion that would come in due to the COVID uh, support. This is absolutely essential and this is our number one message that we've been pushing. Um, it's just pivotal. It's so important that Ukraine and parliament does vote this through uh, over the next couple of weeks. You may have seen the Finance Committee of the Verkhovna Rada meeting today. Uh, there have been obstacles that have been created with 16,000 amendments put to the law. But I think um, we are still very hopeful that this will happen uh, because otherwise some of the um, um, opposition um, to, against the, this, um, uh, the IMF bailout loan is uh, the option would be a default, which would be absolutely catastrophic. And I think, you know, if, if there was any default, you know, the situation would be absolutely dire with uh, hundreds of thousands of people really suffering uh, economic hardship and uh, Ukraine you know, really being battered and bruised uh, in, in a much longer term. So I think the number one um, objective really is now to get the IMF uh, law through. Um, as, uh, uh, as you mentioned, you know, some sectors have been hit immediately we've seen uh, the hospitality sector so all the, ho the the big hotels they closed almost immediately uh we've seen some sectors that are doing uh you know especially well um you know i, I spoke to uber and uh, to glovo and if you look out the windows on the streets of kiev you know you just see so many glovo uh drivers and uber drivers you know getting food food deliveries so but again i think what's most important business uh, the majority of companies understand that they will not meet their um, uh, goals, their financial goals for September 2020, but still so many are helping and donating financially. And so we identified one charity uh, because we were asked you know, by many companies, you know, who do we help with when so many people are asking for help. So we had to do due diligence uh, and we had to identify one charity and we identified patients in Ukraine. So we are encouraging companies and individuals to do really help this, um, uh, provide financial support to this charity, who have probably one of the best understanding of what the reality of the needs are across Ukraine. It's not just, you know, Kiev centric, it's really understanding nationwide, plus them having the ability to have a transparent procurement um, system of the most um, uh, essential needs. At the moment- but, um, I just remind the, uh, the listeners that we have a link in the chat function. There is a link to patients of Ukraine, which Andy just mentioned. Um, yeah. um, Andy, you uh, so you know. I wanted to ask you when I was listening. Um, you're talking about default and uh, or, or, or the possibility that uh, some people 
uh, push for it. Um, I also heard some calls to um, uh, to limit exports uh, of certain key goods and so on. Is there any need for uh, for such measures? I mean, Ukraine Ukraine is in not. You said yourself, it's not in a position it was in uh, 2008, uh, 2009. It's uh, the the banks are liquid. The uh, the situation is. The, the, some lessons were learned from that crisis, so it's it's a very it's a different kind of crisis. And is there a, is there any need for uh, for measures such as that? I mean, there's in in principle there's enough of everything. It's just a question of um, managing it well. Yeah, I mean, uh, just, yeah, absolutely not. Um, you know, there have been some populist talks of um, uh, restricting uh, or imposing quotas on uh, grain imports uh, exports. Sorry. Uh, but there's absolutely no need. And I think, you know, we saw this under the Yanukovych times where uh, there were attempts to artificially uh, either raise uh, costs, uh, but, uh, you know, we do not see any reason for this. And we feel that, um, you know, trade is still so important. You know, keeping those uh, borders open for trade uh, at this time is, is extremely important. Uh, we've seen that, um, you know, transport links have, um, the passenger transport links have been stopped. But we have continued uh, railway, we have continued sea um, uh, freights, and we have continued uh, trucks coming through the borders. We are pushing through green corridors, uh, and this includes all kinds of medical uh, equipment, all kinds of pharmaceuticals, you know, making sure that they are delivered and keep trades uh, moving. There is another very important, um, um, let's say, article of Ukrainian balance of payments, which is remittances and labor migration. So what's going to happen to those people? Well, that, that's a fascinating issue. I mean, um, the, the National Bank figures say uh, remittances last year were 12 billion US dollars. The World Bank puts that at about 16 billion. So this is, this is massive. This is like 10% you know, of uh, Ukraine's GDP. Um, the question- So we, we come, yeah, we're coming to a, um, so a lot of people would have been on the buses going to Poland to pick, okay, not raspberries maybe yet, but to, uh, to start preparing for, for harvest because we're now end of April and I'm harvesting stuff already in my garden because I can't go anywhere else. Uh, but imagining these two, up to two million people which were prepared and uh, to go into the value chains of all this agriculture across Europe. So what's gonna happen? Yeah, well, I think, um, you know, the prime minister today said that two million Ukrainians have come back uh, over the last uh, five weeks. Um, the question is that, um, you know, th these were mainly, um, you know, capable, employable, physically healthy Ukrainians that have uh, been in Poland mostly and working there. Um, and because of the, the COVID outbreak, they, they've come home. Um, I think one issue is really understanding now what happens to them now. Uh, the Prime Minister, they announced that they want to introduce a program where they'll start uh, introducing about 400,000, maybe up to half a million jobs, paying salaries of around 6,000 a day, and that's about 180 pounds a month. Um, but, you know, these um, uh, people that have come back, they were getting salaries of in excess of 1,000 euros uh, in, in Poland. But the one point I, I would like to focus on here is um, because of the, the global shifts and in terms of manufacturing from China, uh, you know, globally understanding that we can't be reliant on China anymore. This is a massive niche, a massive opportunity for Ukraine to step in and to really become a marketing, uh, sorry, a, a manufacturing uh, location. And we've seen this, um, I, I used to travel um, until very recently a lot of, across Ukraine um, and seeing these factories that were opening up um, you know, some of my favorite stories were in Ushhorod, um, literally uh, one mile across the border from Slovakia, uh, a big uh, U.S. factory, j with over 3,000 people working there. And what they're manufacturing is um, Nespresso coffee machines. So if in the U.K., if you go to um, uh, PC World or any electronic store and you have a look at that Nespresso coffee machine, that's made in Ukraine. And I think this... I can't really go to any store at the moment, but uh, I no, imagine... No, not at the moment, yeah. So, uh, yeah, stay at home and um, 
Uh, uh, but, but um, Andy, you say about the replacement uh, of manufacturing. Um, I heard in many other countries they're talking about that, saying, oh, China will be able to manufacture quite so much. But there is also the question of global demand. China is a very big importer of a lot of Ukrainian exports. Agriculture, if I'm not mistaken, is number one importer of Ukrainian vegetable oils and, and whole categories of foods like that. And of course, uh, steel and uh, uh, iron ore and that sort of thing is is the export number one for Ukraine. What if there is a global depression and you know, and then you sort of stuck with how many, how much you can do with your policies and your replacement of manufacturing if you can't sell your pipes, your steel because nobody wants it, nobody's building anything. Yeah, I think we, we have to look at the sectors. I think, you know, you mentioned agriculture. I think there was an article in today's Guardian about, um, you know, the, the needs for food uh, across the world. And I think, you know, Ukraine can definitely, um, you know, provide a lot for feeding, feeding the world. Um, I think, you know, with the law that was passed um, uh, earlier this month on the, um, the land law, uh, opening up uh, selling uh, agricultural land, uh, not not to foreigners for the time being. Um, I think you know it's a very watered down version. But I think you know Ukraine can still be this agricultural powerhouse to to really feed feed the world. So I think you uh, know, yeah. there. I think with steel, you know, you mentioned steel. Uh, obviously, demand for uh, steel, you know, is is hit, and we'll, we'll see how, how that um, um, you know continues. But I think you know for the exports, the the, the major commodities, the soft commodities and the hard commodities. Ukraine has. But again, you know, it's really looking at the manufacturing that Ukraine could offer, looking at, you know, what um, the neighboring countries like Slovakia and Hungary and others did. I think there's a real niche and a strategic plan for Ukraine to really focus on this moving forward. Um, thank you, Andy. And we now have a question to uh, Dr. Suprun um, and my colleagues from the Ukrainian Institute uh, are going to bring this question out to be asked live. So this is a, a question from Maria Romanenko, who represents Hromatska International. So Maria, I think uh, at some point you will be able to um, unmute yourself and ask a question uh, of Dr. Supun. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, great. Uh, hello, hello everyone. Hello, Liana. Uh, so my question is, um, I am from Hamasic International, as was pointed out. So I wanted to ask is, do you think it's um, necessary or desirable to uh, carry out reforms during the pandemic? And what do you think is the cause of so many uh, medical workers in Ukraine? So many medical workers in Ukraine having tested positive? Uh, yes, yes, okay. sorry. Um, well, uh, COVID, the COVID-19 pandemic has really shown that uh, public health is undervalued, especially in Ukraine. We see that developing public health and the healthcare system should be the priority in our country. Um, although uh, very many countries have had, um, have had a challenge in responding to it, Ukraine at this time has only has about six and a half thousand cases and has only done about 67,000 tests compared to say Poland, that has done 224,000 tests and has found 10,000 um, positive uh, uh, patients. Um, and uh, I think that that is a, um, a big difference in the uh, ability of the public health system to respond to what's happening. So um, in, in the last three years, uh, when we were at the Ministry of Health, uh, uh, I should say uh, three and a half years ago, when we were at the Ministry of Health, um, we put, uh, we made sure that in our government, in our cabinet of ministers, together with Volodymyr Hroyspun, that healthcare was a priority, and we started the healthcare reform. Ukrainians now have primary care physicians that they chose themselves. They never had that in the past. They were assigned a primary care physician based on their location of where they're registered. They now have a physician that they can call and ask questions and be referred to the right places when they become sick. Now, the next stage of healthcare reform starting on April 1st is changing the way that um, hospitalization and specialized care is financed. It really isn't anything that's in the forefront where patients would see a difference in the care that's provided for them in the sense that they still will be able to go to a hospital and receive treatment. However, now the National Health Service of Ukraine will pay directly to that hospital rather than a subvention that keeps that hospital open. So um, the difference uh, or the change that's happening needs to be done. And the reason that there are so few 
ventilators in Ukraine and so few hospital beds in Ukraine and that the uh, hospitals have not yet been restructured is because healthcare reform at that level is only starting now. Now, if we had gotten um, the law passed earlier and if we had been able to work faster, not being um, slowed down by the parliament and not being slowed down by the um, uh, massive opposition to what we were doing in the healthcare uh, reform, then we may have been further along at this point. So the investment in healthcare needs to be on a regular basis. It can't be done as a one-off. It needs to be routine every day. Healthcare and public health is a national security issue. Just in the last, yesterday, it was one year since President Zelensky was elected. And I've read quite a number of um, reviews of his year in office and what he's done. And I was shocked to see that even though the last three months or 25% of President Zelensky's time in office was associated or was during the time of a pandemic, none of those reviews even mentioned the pandemic response or healthcare reform. It's something that is not in a priority for this government and not in the priority for this president until it was thrown at them because of a pandemic that's happening. So basically, um, I think that it's very appropriate that we continue with healthcare reform. Um, those things that are happening on a routine level see, need to continue to happen. There's an example, say, of procurement of medicines in Ukraine. We now procure through international organizations. And um, every year that procurement is done on a routine basis. One and a half million Ukrainians are dependent on this procurement to receive their medicines. That's cancer patients, patients who have HIV, patients who have tuberculosis, patients who have orphan illnesses and need to have those medicines on a routine basis. Um, because of the uh, revolving door policy at the Ministry of Health, where we've had three ministers in the last month and a half, that procurement process is at a standstill. Those routine things need to continue to happen because a patient who needs to have medicine for their HIV needs to have that medicine even though there's a pandemic going on. We can't stop functioning. All of uh, the rest of the medical system can't stop functioning because there's a pandemic. We need to continue to treat those patients that need it. So um, I think that the best, um, the best way to move forward is to continue with the reform. Um, what's done, what has um, improved when it comes to the pandemic is there was a change in the budget that was passed by parliament last week where there was a 13% in increase in the MOH funding. There was a 22% increase in the funding for the National Health Service of Ukraine and a 22% increase in the um, uh, funding for the medical guarantees program or the, the services that will, will be provided. Again, this is only about three and a half percent of the budget being allocated for healthcare. Look at your own budgets in your own countries. In the UK, that's eight to 10%. In the United States, it's 17%. And in Ukraine, it's only three and a half percent. So I think that if we stopped the reform, it would be disastrous. And um, earlier I had explained the reasons why the healthcare workers are um, being infected more than others. First of all, they're being tested more, so we know that. In Ukraine, with only 67,000 tests, that's not 67,000 people. That's 67,000 tests. And one person who has COVID will have a test four times. So um, we're not talking even about 67,000 people. I had mentioned the reason why in the previous um, talk, in the previous uh, presentation that I had. So we can go back to that later and talk about it. Dr. Supron, I, I, I'm waving here because um, my colleagues from Ukrainian Institute are bringing up the question that you started already answering. But uh, we, we, have, we have the question about, from Olena Dotsenko. I don't know if she's, uh, she's here. Um, Olena, you, uh, you were interested in the statistics in Ukraine. Can you please ask your question? Um, I, as I said, uh, not in statistics, but uh, as I said, whom to follow, which authorities or sources to follow to get St reliable statistical information of people infected or diseased from COVID-19. Which sources to follow? Or, or those who are recovered, actually. That's another interesting Any question. Any question, which sources to look at? Obviously, we know that uh, data is evolving everywhere, but in Ukraine in particular, because numbers very low. 
total death is unknown. So is there, yes, I, I suppose there is an official statistics. Um, and then there, there are maybe some formulas which could allow us to estimate the real numbers. Um, or, or is it safer to stick with what the government is saying in, in, trying, to, in trying to estimate the scale of the problem? Well, as in um, every other country in Europe and in the world, we are dependent upon the government to provide the numbers, the statistics. The um, uh, public health, the National Public Health uh, Center is the one that publishes the numbers every day. They talk about how many tests were done, uh, how many people were diagnosed uh, positive for uh, having SARS-CoV-2 or having the virus. Um, there also is uh, the number of deaths that have been reported and also the number of recovered that have been reported. Those are all um, public, uh, that's all public knowledge. However, those numbers, um, many think that those numbers are low because the testing started very late in Ukraine. There was a, a lack of tests and this, there was an inability to perform the tests. Then there was a lack of laboratory equipment that was necessary to um, get the results of the tests. And um, there was also a um, unwritten rule for the physicians, and many of them have told us this in confidence, that they were told not to test as many patients to keep the numbers low. Um, they were still waiting to see what the, um, will there be enough capacity for the response. In Ukraine, since um, the um, electronic health system has only started being developed in the last couple of years, there still isn't an electronic database for deaths, total deaths at any month or any day. Um, the deaths are collected uh, on a monthly basis from the oblast on paper. They're sent to the uh, National Statistics Center, they're counted, and we find out what the total deaths were and the monthly death rates were in Ukraine about six months into the following year. So we don't know how many deaths there are because there isn't an electronic system that tells us day by day or week by week or month by month how many deaths there are in Ukraine. So there may be a lag time for us to know whether, as in very many countries right now, we're wondering whether in February and March we missed some of these um, illnesses, some of the COVID-19 cases and some of the deaths that happened. And we'll only see this when we review the uh, mortality in, in those months. Mm. In um, Ukraine, as in other countries, most of the people, very many people are probably uh, either asymptomatic or having mild symptoms. There are a number, uh, quite a number of people that are, um, that are at home, they're sheltering at home and in isolation with symptoms. Not all of them are even being tested because if the symptoms are quite um, uh, commensurate with COVID-19, they're told to act as if they have COVID-19 without even necessarily doing the test. And a lot of that had to do with the lack of tests. And again, the culture that I spoke about earlier, um, that's a legacy from the Soviet system, is used as the minimal amount of resources as possible to uh, save on financing and save on equipment. Dr. Subron, I, um, I have to comment uh, here that in the UK, we see exactly the same. Maybe not exactly, but uh, Suspected COVID-19 cases are told to self-isolate, not to go to any doctors, not to leave the house, get everything delivered on the doorstep, not to open the door, even to, to say hi, you know, and put viruses on the face of the delivery person. So, and to assume that you have it and, um, and be, to behave as if you had it. So it's, it's, it's not the same, but it's similar here as well. And uh, of course, the, the, you know, statistical lag is, what you're describing is quite striking. But we've seen in Spain and Italy, uh, the death statistics start coming in and there is obviously a discrepancy between the spike in deaths, the last year's level of deaths and the COVID-19 deaths. And there's still a, a large uh, number that is unexplained, that is in nursing homes, that is in, ho in, in the home with a different diagnosis. So Ukraine is not unique in having, uh, in having statistics that uh, not everybody necessarily uh, buys right away, but um, well, I think we that there's also something that we should understand is that there are those that have died because of the COVID disease that they have 
um, pneumonia or because of the pneumonia that they have the uh, respiratory problems, the, um, the virus actually can attack the heart as well. And now we're finding out that it can attack the kidneys as well. And so there are kidney failure patients that are now dying from organ failure. There are also though those patients that are not going to the hospital or not being treated because um, they are afraid to uh, go to the hospital because of the scare of COVID-19. And so there are some related deaths that say you have a heart attack, but you don't call and go into the hospital because you don't want to overwhelm the hospital or you don't want to get uh, COVID-19. And I think that there's going to be um, quite a number of patients that probably could have been saved, but because of the resources being allocated for only one illness and not doing the routine uh, treatment that's necessary that um, uh, those patients may mm. have, we may have saved their lives. So the, there is a cost, uh, whichever way you go. Um, uh, just to remind our listeners that, uh, well, they don't need the reminder, but of course, Ulana Suprun is a former minister of, of healthcare in Ukraine, uh, and they also have healthcare reforms, which you mentioned um, several times. We'll come to the question of lifting the quarantine, I think, in a moment, Dr. Suprun. Um, Andy Hunder is a former director, of course, of Ukrainian Institute, so he knows it very well. Uh, for five years, weren't you, um, Andy, the director? And now he chairs the American Chamber of Commerce in Kiev, in Ukraine, so he knows everything about business. Um, and we have a question about business, and the, the, the question about the business support, and it's from Orisa Marchuk. I think, um, um, I think Orisa must be somewhere here. Yes, Pani Orisu, uh, can you please ask your question live? And your question is to Andy. Yeah, fine. Um, Andy, um, a big thing in the United Kingdom is the support of business by the government and by uh, uh, all sorts of schemes which which are laid out. Is there something of that sort um, planned in Ukraine? Uh, for, as far as you know, I also would sneak in a question um, to Ulana Suprun. What is the percentage of people in old people's homes and is that concern, this scenario which we see in the United Kingdom with uh, uh, old people's home being a neglected um, area of uh, lots of uh, uh, um, uh, illness with, with COVID. Is that a similar uh, concern in Ukraine too? Thank you very much. Yeah. Oh, so thank you, Alicia. Uh, I mean, the, the answer is um, that, that, that there is no real comparison. I mean, I've, I've been following the numbers the Chancellor has um, uh, announced in the UK and those in the United States. Um, I mean, in terms of Ukraine, there, there were nowhere near those numbers in terms of any sort of uh, bailouts or business support or furlough programs. Uh, there, are, uh, there is a fund that is now being set up. It's about um, 96 billion hryvnias. Um, um, and the question is that's still very much undecided how that will be used to support um, uh, business. There is um, a council, an economic council that the Prime Minister has now set up. Uh, there's also a think tank that's uh, being uh, set up which we're actually contributing, really understanding how to reopen this um, economy because um, we've seen the numbers and Ukrainians don't have savings to last for uh, another couple of months. So really, it's just so important to get people back to work. Uh, but as um, you know, obviously, it's when to do it and when is the right time to do it. Because if you do it too quickly, and we, we expect the peak of the virus here in Ukraine, the first week of May. So we, we're still uh, getting to that peak. And we are seeing uh, more and more cases um, uh, now. And I think it's really understanding when we hit that peak in May, um, the, the quarantine has been uh, uh, extended until May 12th, and it's really sort of seeing uh, what happens um, uh, then. Uh, there have been some um, uh, local uh, uh, tax cuts on land, uh, which um, uh, the, the central government announced and the, the local mayors were not extremely happy with because that's um, the finances that went to the local budgets. Um, I think from our side, you know, we have been working closely with uh, the government and uh, with the municipal authorities uh, in terms of keeping those businesses going. Initially, it was really understanding which businesses could open. Uh, for example, you know, restaurants uh, shut almost immediately, but we said, you know, keep the delivery services open so you 
Here in Ukraine, you have McDonald's that the restaurants are closed, but McDonald's drive through and McDonald's delivery is still very much um, open. We have um, uh, another issue that was, it was getting people to work because um, the Kiev in the, the metro in um, Kiev, Kharkiv, and Dnipro is closed. There is no underground, um, and uh, there are the, the, the public buses. In order to get onto a, a bus to go to work, you need a special pass. And these were only uh, distributed to essential workers. And essential workers, you know, that's not only the um, staff at the, the health service, um, but that's also the businesses that keep going, you know, the petrol stations, the mobile phone operators, the supermarkets. So in terms of getting people to work, that, that's something that we're working on uh, together with um, both uh, the, the government, uh, the Prime Minister's office, the Minister of Economy, and also with uh, here in Kiev with Mayor Klitschko, but also the other mayors uh, across, um, across uh, the country. But um, it, it will be, the, 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 the biggest hit will be taken by the small and the medium uh, enterprises, um, you know, we, we do expect that that hits to be taken. Um, and uh, it's really now, it's coming out of this hole as quickly as possible in order to keep the, the, the business um, going and to keep uh, salaries coming into uh, Ukrainian citizens. Uh, so there is a related question, I guess, uh, that the, both of you can address. Um, and it's from Sergei Lesik. I will read it out. Um, he's asking Uliana the question, but I think Andy can uh, also chip in. And that's the best strategy to come out of the current lockdown. So, uh, Pani Ulyana, you mentioned a possible end of lockdown of 12th of May, and you said before this program that there is a lot that needs still to be done in terms of healthcare preparedness for this lockdown. So, what needs to be done, and does it have to be gradual, maybe? And then uh, maybe Andy can also comment on the uh, possibility of gradual lock, uh, you know, removal of these measures um, in economic terms. Uh, Pani Supron, you first. Sure, very quickly, I'll answer the question about the um, uh, nursing homes. In Ukraine, there aren't a large number of nursing homes or palliative care centers because it isn't traditional in Ukraine for that to happen. However, if we look at what the, uh, the um, mortality from COVID-19, if we look at the age distribution currently, which is the statistics from this morning, 7% are ages 0 to 17, 12% are ages 18 to 29, 37% are ages 30 to 49, another 37% is ages 50 to 69, and only 8% is above the age of 70. So that you understand that the bulk of the mortality is between the age of 30 and 69. That's not the usual nursing home contingent. But clearly in Ukraine, people don't live the sort of ages that we've seen in Italy, because in Italy, the average age of COVID-19 victim is about 80 years old, right? 79.5 years. So that, that, that's the average. Um, well, in Ukraine, the, uh, it matters um, how you look at it. The, uh, for women, the mortality is at 76, so it's not that low. But um, if somebody lives up until the age of 60, then their, um, their, uh, the ability to live longer, up to age 80, increases. So if you already are 60 or 62 or 63 years old, your, um, the chance of you living to age 80 or 85 is actually quite high. Oh, but you need to self you need the age distribution for you to understand when it came to the question about nursing homes. There aren't a lot of nursing homes, there aren't a lot of palliative care centers, and the mortality of 70 and over is not that high. In other words, there aren't that many cases of people dying over the age of 70. So that answers the question that was earlier. Um, then the other question about um, what, do, what do we need to do to come out of this? Um, as Andy already said, uh, Ukraine has not reached its peak. It's not even close to reaching its peak, and every day the cases pretty much are rising. Or every two to three days, it's doubling in time, uh, doubling in number, and I think that um, it's going to continue to increase. Um, the quarantine measures are really just um, buying time. Quarantine doesn't stop the virus. Quarantine lessens the number of people who are infected at any single moment in time. The virus doesn't go away. It's not some kind of magical talisman that if we wear a mask, all of a sudden the virus will leave existence. It doesn't. And with this time, we're, we're pretty much taking out a loan. It's credit. And we're going to have to pay that credit back. No credit is given to you without interest. 
And what Andy's going to talk about, or what he's already talk about, talking about, is how we're going to pay that credit back. And unfortunately, it's going to be not only with the lives that we lose uh, for the, those people who um, die from COVID-19, but there is also um, some disability that will come with it. Already, there are people who, have, who are disabled because of problems with breathing, and um, getting back um, into a workforce will be difficult. Um, one of the big uh, challenges we have is the um, massive uh, economic crisis that the COVID-19 pandemic has caused throughout the world. And what Andy was saying for Ukraine with um, agriculture, um, the actual statistics that I saw today in The Guardian, and, and that came from a report by the UN World Food Program, that they had anticipated about 130 million people will need additional help with um, nutrition next year. And because of the COVID-19, or I'm sorry, this year in 2020, because of the COVID-19 crisis, that has doubled to 265 million will starve unless they get food aid from UN agencies and other humanitarian agencies. That may be somewhat of an opportunity for Ukraine, but this is a very, very bad news for those people who depend on um, agriculture uh, to uh, their agricultural business to keep them going. So those are the things that we need to look at. Now, before we can exit, there are certain criteria that must be met. Those are public health criteria. Number one, there needs to be a minimal risk of community transmission based on sustained evidence of a downward trend in new cases and fatalities. That means over at least a 10 day period of time that there's a decrease every day in the number of cases and the number of fatalities. So we see that there's a trend down, not a trend of even, but a trend down. Unfortunately, today, the cabinet of ministers presented in a, a plateau effect as a sign where we could go out of quarantine. That's not correct. It should be decreasing. There should be a robust and coordinated and well-supplied testing network, which has not been developed yet in Ukraine a well-resourced public health system that can do the surveillance and the contact tracing that's necessary to identify all the cases. Again, that's been established in a couple of oblasts. It's still not throughout the entire country. And in the end, we need to have fully resourced hospitals and healthcare workforce that's ready to respond if there's an uptick of cases when we come out of quarantine. Now, these are prerequisites to the quarantine, coming out of the quarantine. So I think Andy can tell a little bit more about the government's plan or what business expects when these are met, how we will step out of this quarantine. Just to, uh, just to follow up, I mean, the conditions that you named have not been met in the UK. So that probably That's means that, that the UK That's has a uh, very poor we'll chance a lot of, of work to do, yes. coming out of quarantine we because there's not a lot of work to do. Yeah, yes. there's no testing for general, there's no tracing of anything, the hospitals are not ready and uh, so essentially Ukraine is not alone in being, um, um, let's softly say, underprepared for such a situation. But one of the questions, I'm looking at the Q&A box and one of the questions uh, is bringing up Sweden. So uh, there's two questions actually that bring up Sweden and Sweden did not have such restrictive measures as a lot of other countries. And um, I haven't seen the latest statistics, but it, it didn't look uh, drastically worse than, I think it's still slightly no, uh, slightly worse than some European countries, but it's, it wasn't an order of magnitude worse. So um, is it because of all of those conditions that you mentioned, uh, Dr. Sukron, or, or is it a special Swedish sort of Viking, you know, um, gene that protects them from well, there, there are two different ways that you can approach a pandemic such as the one that um, is uh, happening right now, the COVID-19 pandemic. One is to lock everybody down and close them up and buy time to try to get your system ready or to create a vaccine or to find medication that could help. But it really is a very, um, it's not a very well-planned or strategic way of looking at things. Um, how long is it going to take us to develop a vaccine? They're telling us a year. Are there medicines that treat this disease? Not yet. So what are we supposed to do? We can't stay in lockdown for a year until a vaccine is created because we'll, we will then create more problems with the economic hardships and the lockdown than we have from the actual uh, disease. The other way of doing it is to have um, measures where you do social distancing or 
physical distancing, where you stand far enough apart so that there's not as much transmission of disease, where you wash your hands, where you um, limit the amount of people gathered in a one room together so it's not passed along as much, and you do limited testing to those people who have symptoms. This is what Sweden has chosen. And the number of uh, deaths in Sweden will probably be no more in the end than the total accumulated deaths that are in countries of a similar population. What often is a mistake that's done by non-epidemiologists is that they look at the current number of people who tested positive and the current number of deaths and try to predict what the um, mortality rate, or actually in this case is lethality rate from the disease, which is the number of people who had a positive test and the number of people who died and what the percentage of that is. We will, never, we will not know that until the, um, the end of this pandemic, when we can do serological testing and see in the general population how many people had been exposed. And after we see that say in the UK, 10 million people were exposed. And of those 10 million people, 100,000 people died, at that point we can say what the percentage of lethality is. At this time, we're just guessing. What um, Sweden has done is they've taken a, the second road, the road um, less well-traveled, um, as, uh, uh, as certain American poets have said, and it doesn't mean that they're wrong, they just made a different choice. Now, that choice depended on trust in their government, it depended on people following the rules that were laid out by their government. I don't know if you saw this, but there was this very um, clear difference in um, societal um, following, following of rules. There was a picture of people standing in line for the bus in Sweden, and they were all standing two meters apart from each other, waiting for the bus without any lines. They just did it themselves, standing the way that they should. And then they had a photo of um, people waiting for a bus in, in Ukraine. They all were wearing their masks, but they were all bunched together on top of each other. Well, the mask won't help you in that situation because you need to have a mask and social distancing. So when people follow the rules and they trust their government, they may be successful in a different approach to fighting the pandemic. And um, one or the other, we will have okay. to see in the end which one will work better, but I think they probably will end up being equal. Uh, so we have different ways of looking at things and uh, there's a number of questions also. Does ibuprofen work? Uh, do masks work? I think I can dispatch with those questions by saying uh, nobody quite knows and uh, ask and talk to your physician. So we're going to spend time discussing that one again. But uh, now let's turn to Andy um, and ask him about the lockdown and the, maybe the gradual removal of the lockdown. So Pani Sukhoi yeah. already covered the, 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 uh, the issue that there's that the healthcare system um, is not prepared to the degree that she's suggesting is needed for that. Will, under, under those conditions, will the gradual removal of protective measures actually help the economy? Will it not help the economy? And what, what economically, what, does it, what makes sense? Well, I think the, the number one absolute priority for, for business and for, for our members is uh, the health and safety of, of all uh, employees. And I think any decisions that will be made, the number one priority, that, that that's what will be the most important. Um, we are pushing to get the economy restarted. And I think we are uh, really understand how crucial it is to get that economy uh, moving again. I think it's in the UK, it's, it's watching the, the health secretary and the chancellor always debating, you know, at what stage and who, who goes first. I think, you know, we are looking and we are speaking to our colleagues, both at the American Chamber, in China, in other jurisdictions, China, we think they're about 60 days ahead of us, and we're, we're trying to see what worked there and what didn't work there. So I think it's looking at best practice, um, and um, you know, other countries, we're looking closely. Italy, we're in touch. I spoke to my colleagues in Italy today, in Spain, uh, Germany, uh, you know, a really fascinating example, Israel, um, and, uh, and you mentioned Sweden also. Um, I think you know, for Ukraine, it's really getting the testing. I think until we get the reassurance that um, we can start opening up um, shops, retail, um, shopping malls. It's really understanding sort of the, um, uh, the testing and so who are the risk zones and uh, taking it from there. So, you know, although, uh, you know, we will be pushing to really work with the government to get that economy up and reopen soon, I think until we are uh, satisfied that this, you know, the employees and all the, the, the Ukraines are safe in terms of going back, 
I think that, that that's the priority we still um, we're looking at. So I think you know there, there, there's no clear strategy at the moment, but it, it is in process. And I said you know uh, the the government has put together this think tank, uh, bringing in um, experts from from different angles and really understanding what when is that day said okay green light let's open up. Um, I'm looking at the clock, and um, I said at the beginning that we'll. Um, talk for an hour, um, we still have 130 people tuned in. So maybe to sum, to sum up, well, first of all, uh, I have to remind people that uh, on ukrainianinstitute.org.uk they can find uh, future events, in, including the one on the 4th of May uh, on the uh, Second World War narrative. Uh, there's all sorts of uh, Twitter handles and social media events. Please post about this event and tag Ukrainian Institute. I didn't say it in the beginning, but please uh, um, let's all rush to our social media uh, profiles and do some um, some feverish tweeting and Instagramming and Facebooking. Um, and um, maybe to sum up, uh, maybe our, our panelists can say what's the biggest challenge uh, and what's the biggest opportunity. I know that's what everybody is asking, but <laughs> but hopefully we can also look at the uh, um, at the opportunities. And uh, Andy mentioned one opportunity, but maybe may, maybe you, Dr. Suprun, can also um, not, you know maybe think of a silver lining. I was thinking of the pharmaceutical industry in Ukraine. It's uh, it's it's fairly strong uh, considering. Uh, so is there, is there maybe some uptake there that maybe people can develop that industry or some or some other thing based on this pandemic? Is, is, there, is there anything that, uh, that people can do in economic terms to somehow turn the disaster into an opportunity? Well, I think the biggest challenge, um, which we didn't really talk about that much, was um, is about communication. I think that there's not enough transparency and coordinated communication coming from the government so that people understand what they need to do and um, what, the, uh, what the rules are currently and the plan on how we will come out of this. And it's caused quite a bit of frustration, especially in the beginning when there wasn't any clear leadership. When the Ministry of Health had a revolving door policy and um, the president uh, was communicating one thing, the ministry a different thing, the Center for Public Health and Local Government was communicating something else. I think that that's one of the great challenges and um, it needs to be addressed. The communication has not been coordinated. It needs to be better coordinated and clearer for the people. And there needs to be more transparency about what's happening. Statistics, where the PPE is going, which hospitals are the ones that need help, which ones don't need help. I think that that would be very helpful for people to feel more comfortable. Now, when it comes to opportunity, um, I think that there are a couple of things. Um, one is that once again, um, public health and the healthcare system is in the priority and there will be more attention paid to financing and improving the healthcare system because of the uh, pan uh, pandemic that's happening right now. Um, I would certainly hope that that's not what needs to be done to change the healthcare system because we were able to do at least part of the reform when we were in a more um, um, strategic mode and not in a crisis mode. And, and you, be, you believe, by the way, that those, uh, those measures put in place, the first phase of the reform that you initiated as health minister, uh, made Ukrainian health stronger. For more this. robust, more robust and able to respond to this. Also creating a public health center rather than a Sanna Pitsluzhba, which really had been just a corrupt agency that took bribes from businesses to give them certificates and didn't really do much in the sense of public health. So those things did help in the response, but the attention paid to the public health center making it a, or the public health sphere making it a priority is great that it's finally being put forward as a priority. I hope that it continues to move forward. Um, another, uh, another opportunity is to um, develop um, not just in the pharmaceutical industry, but um, basically internally within Ukraine, um, a supply chain for those things that are necessary. When it comes to PPE, it's not as though it will end when the, um, when the pandemic is over. We still need to have PPE in Ukraine. We still need to start making our own ventilators and not depending on importing them from other countries. And if we can do those things, we may be able to even export them. Uh, Ukraine does have quite a bit of um, opportunity and know-how in those areas, and I think that we should move forward with it. And um, industrial um, capacity, which is more or less... A little bit of an issue because there really aren't any pharmaceuticals that work 
for COVID-19, and unfortunately, Ukraine has well, um, has um, paracetamol. Uh, yes, but that's uh, Ukraine is uh, uh, Ukrainian um, pharmaceutical company is now producing the uh, malaria medicine that is being used in clinical trials. Unfortunately, things are moving not in the right direction when it comes to the protocols of care here in Ukraine, but um, uh, that's a different issue and we'll see how things develop over time. Yeah, that's a whole new conversation for much longer than one hour, I suppose. Yeah. Um, well, if I, if I could just jump in there also, yeah. I think mm -hmm. um, in terms of the, um, you know, the opportunities, I think we've spoken about the challenges, but I think the, the opportunities and I fully agree with Oliana. I mean, we've been pushing to get uh, government spend on healthcare up to 5% at least of GDP. I think that that, that is just so uh, important, you know, and it's really a paradigm shift, understanding how important healthcare is. And I think this is the opportunity to use it. In terms of communications, I think, um, you know, this is, um, we, we, we launched on our social media, on our Facebook, on LinkedIn, on Twitter, uh, a, a video series called Leadership uh, in Times of Crisis where you know, CEOs, general managers, are really showing what their leadership is. And most of it is about communication. And I fully agree with Uliana, it's you know, how uh, people are communicating, but also what leadership skills people are opening up in themselves and in others. And I think you know, using this opportunity, um, using this crisis as an opportunity. One of the things we've been pushing for in Ukraine is you know, we're sat at home, we've been sat at home for 38 days now. And um, in terms of uh, signatures, and contracts. In Ukraine, you always need a rubber stamp, you know, a Soviet legacy rubber stamp. Without a rubber stamp, the contract is invalid. So we've been working with the Ministry of um, Digital um, uh, Digitalization, really pushing, saying, let's move now. Let's use this opportunity to move to digital signatures. You know, forget the rubber Soviet stamps. That, that you know, this is the time to get rid of that. So I think it's, you know, really using these opportunities. I think this is the new normal. I think, you know, th this has changed the way we do business. Uh, and I think, you know, uh, many things that we're doing now or many things that we used to do two months ago, we won't be doing any anymore. Uh, and I think it's really understanding, uh, you know, what, what the values are. And I think it's the solidarity. I think, you know, this has brought so many good people together, uh, really understanding, you know, what the values are uh, and so people working together. So um, I think, you know, it, it's what we can take from this um, you know, for, for the future, what we can take uh, moving forward. You know, uh, so much um, empathy, so much uh, support from real leaders. And um, I think, you know, th th this could really define uh, the future uh, and change a lot of things we we've done in Ukraine for the last uh, 30 years. Um, I think uh, uh, one thing I just wanted to add, what Andy was saying is that um, uh, in, the, in the beginning of the Russian-Ukrainian war, when civil society came together with business and basically clothed, fed, and armed the Ukrainian military is very similar to what's happening now in Ukraine. That civil society is very strong. And it kicked in almost immediately and began to help the hospitals and the new front line, uh, which is in the hospitals, which is the medical workers, which are like the soldiers and the volunteers that we were helping in the beginning of the war. So um, I think what Andy's saying um, is very true about the fact that new, not even new solidarity, but the old solidarity that was left over, the very strong civil society that has built up over the last five or six years has really helped Ukraine to be able to better uh, face this challenge than they could have in the past. And just also wanted to mention that we also started a video um, blog. Um, uh, we have a YouTube channel at RQA. It's called RQA um, and the... Um, uh, the program or the series is called the Ministry of Common Sense or Ministerstvo Zdorovoho Luzdu. Uh, so I invite point. everyone you, to take a look at that as well. Can you please, so I'm under uh, another order to have another poll, final poll about how people heard about this event. Again, this is going to help Ukrainian Institute. Can you type, you know, there is a chat function. I don't know if you can see it, uh, Pani Ulano. Maybe mm -hmm. you can type the name of the uh, of this initiative. So that people can see. Sure. Um, and mm -hmm. so, me, meanwhile, here's the poll. How did you hear about this event? Um, obviously, some people have heard from the Facebook pages of Ukrainian Institute, and uh, some probably got some marketing, uh, and some joined because uh, I asked them to. Um, <laughs> you know, when, when we were talking about uh, opportunities, um, I remember two sectors um, in Ukraine that are quite. Um, uh, dynamic. One is IT sector, um, including software programming like games and so on. And of course, everybody around the world is sitting now trying to, you know, playing computer games. 
uh, if they are not uh, doing webinars for Ukrainian Institute. And another, uh, another sector that people don't think about often is the, uh, um, I don't even know the term in English, is the cartoon sector. So there is a lot of uh, production of um, cartoons, uh, that, uh, you know, for expert. And I was thinking, is there maybe somebody could sit down in Ukraine and create some viral, uh, pardon the pun, video explaining um, maybe to children how to wash their hands and to um, and and use those use those opportunities of uh, distance working of this digital economy that Ukraine's already embarked on um, somehow to benefit the economy and the and the healthcare or the sector in in this time of the pandemic. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I can just mention on the IT, I mean, the IT sector has been probably one of the fastest growing sectors in Ukraine over the last years. And uh, I think some of the uh, revenue generation has been around $4 billion. Um, most of these, um, you know, they're very visible. Any sort of business centers that go up in Kiev or uh, across the country now, the first tenants that have moved in there have been IT companies. What we've seen now is all these, you know, they're, they're all very young. They're all 30. And you can see them they're in shorts, all very and t-shirts and very, very, very talented IT programmers. Uh, like 90, I think 97% now are, are working from home. And uh, what the objective is to really keep these um, uh, teams together because they, they are uh, very talented. And, you know, and I think, you know, the animated films you mentioned, um, uh, a, a lot of the stuff that goes on in Hollywood and, and um, yeah, the special effects, a lot of that is, is being put together uh, here in, in, in Ukraine. And I think, you know, the, the, the other sectors, um, uh, that, that also, I think, you know, just one thing I would like to mention, um, tomorrow the National Bank of Ukraine will make an announcement and um, we expect that this will be the first time that the uh, interest rates of the central bank or national bank will be single digits for over six years. So wow. we, expect, wow. Wow. Uh, we expect the National Bank to announce tomorrow eight possibly eight and a half percent, which I mean, okay, and in, in the UK that that's down still uh, quite high, but considering, you know, we were at 30% only just a few years ago, I think the fact that yeah. the National Bank is, is announcing eight, maybe 8.5%. Well, that would be a huge stimulus, of uh, course. Announcement. Uh, we have the results of the polls, so Facebook and uh, Ukrainian, so Ukrainian Institute newsletter has beaten Facebook in this poll, which is great. So Ukrainian Institute is stronger than Facebook in promoting uh, its own events. I think that's fantastic news because over reliance on the social media, I guess we're all stuck with it uh, during the quarantine, but still. Um, and uh, so yes, animation films uh, uh, helpfully writes Serhii Kovella in the chat function. And uh, maybe just the last minute uh, of your time, Pani Suprun, there is also a question of telemedicine which in Ukraine people don't really understand um, so yet so far very well what, it, what it's for. And some people think or that, you know, if you see a doctor on screen, you somehow not getting the real service. So you need to go into the clinic and you need to get into the physician's, uh, not face necessarily, but you, get, you need to physically be there for them to um, accurately diagnose you and provide you with um, quality healthcare. What do you think? Is this an opportunity for people to start thinking about telemedicine's development, which is, which is well, A, probably the way of the future, and B, is much safer for healthcare workers in a situation like this one? Well, from the very, um, from the very start, there was um, a lot of uh, attempts at communication, and eventually, um, I think that the message mm -hmm. did get out that uh, patients should not just come into their ambulatory, or their um, primary care center, and instead they should call ahead and speak to their physician or speak to one of the nurses there to find out whether they should come in. It took a, a short, some period of time. However, with um, through the National Health Service of Ukraine um, and uh, our organization helped to create algorithms for the ambulatory centers on how they should um, uh, organize their work so that there are well patient days, there are times of the day when patients who are sick and want to come and see the doctor are scheduled to come in so that it wasn't a mix of both you know, healthy children and sick children coming in on the same day, putting up signs and having different entrances and different rules for those people who have COVID symptoms so that the uh, personnel knew to wear PPE when they were seeing the patients. And those kinds of things um, 
have now been instituted in most of the ambulatory centers. So I think that um, they've, uh, they've learned quite a bit on how to actually um, control the uh, contagion as, um, as, uh, as they moved forward. Um, many Ukrainians are now more comfortable with speaking on the telephone. Uh, sometimes the physicians are the ones that aren't as comfortable about it. And um, we have a program that's been in place since uh, April of 2017 called Dostupni Lieke, where there is a prescription that's written by your uh, primary care physician for cardiovascular disease type 2 diabetes or bronchial asthma. You can get your medicine at no cost or with a small copay if you go through the government program. So you go to your primary care physician, and now we have e-prescriptions, e so electronic prescriptions, and then they get sent directly to the pharmacy. Um, this is something that was instituted over a very short period, uh, over a six month period of time in Ukraine. It's very successful. And um, uh, patients um, have been uh, kind of met with the resistance of the physicians to write that, send that prescription to a pharmacist, even without seeing the patient. Because if it's somebody who's been taking these medicines for years, why come in every month just to see the physician waste their time when all you need really is your prescription filled? So um, there's been a learning curve on both sides, the patient side and the physician side. And there's a lot more acceptance to um, speaking over the telephone or um, having a little bit more of a telemedicine type of um, relationship. It will take some time before it changes. And we all know the, the uh, little old ladies who like to come to their physician's office and to sit and wait in line. Currently, because of the reform of the healthcare system, patients for the first time ever in the history of Ukraine have a can now choose their own primary care physician rather than have one assigned. They can make an appointment to see their physician because they never could in the past. They would have to sit and wait in a line with everyone else until their physician could see them. And they have a list of guaranteed services that are provided at no cost to them at their primary care physician and now at the hospital level that's paid for by the National Health Service of Ukraine. For people who live in the United States and Canada and uh, the UK and in Europe, for them that's normal. In Ukraine, this is a revolution that's happened over the last three years. And um, it's because of this that people are beginning to trust more the medical system and um, have new, uh, a new way of approaching their own health as well as the healthcare system itself. Um, thank you very much. So I've kept uh, you and the audience, we still have over 100 people, uh, for 20 minutes over the promised one hour. Um, I want to thank you very much uh, to Dr. Suprun, Ulyana Suprun, the former uh, health minister of Ukraine, and now she's uh, typed in the name of the new uh, company rqa.org uh, in a chat function. Um, the seminar, this webinar will be uploaded to YouTube channel of Ukrainian Institute. Um, Andy Hunder was with us as well from the American Chamber of Commerce and former director of Ukrainian Institute, of course, in London as well. Uh, just to sum up, so everything is very, very bad, but not quite that bad because as opposed to the last crisis, the global financial crisis, the banks are uh, more liquid, there is, um, this healthcare system is is maybe bad, but again, not that bad because Pani Supron started reforms which put it in a slightly uh, better shape to cope with the pandemic. The economic situation is, uh, of course, very terrible, but again, there are some uh, improvements and efficiencies that can be found, um, and this crisis should not be wasted. And uh, new uh, technologies and pr processes such as telemedicine and um, and IT and um, and other remote working systems can be introduced and maybe in the future this can bring things like proper healthcare and maybe Wi-Fi broadband to remote Ukrainian villages and towns so who knows fingers crossed of course uh, it's maybe I'm dreaming but I want to finish on a positive note and uh, to pass the word back to Marina Denisenko the current director of Ukrainian Institute. Uh, thank you, Svetlana. Uh, I would like to thank uh, the speakers and the moderator. There's been so many important points raised in this discussion. And indeed, uh, we in the UK, we follow the pandemics very closely and there are lots of challenges in the UK as well, even though the capacity of its healthcare and, uh, you know, economic system are, is much more robust. Uh, I think there's no clear scenario for the UK government how to exit the as well. Um, thanks again, and I would like to ask everybody who participated to um, 
also uh, take part in our poll, which will help us to identify how to market our events much better. And we would be very thankful for any donation. Please, if you would like to follow this event on social media, do so, and we're going to cover it uh, on Twitter and Facebook. And finally, I invite you to join us on the 4th of May to have an exciting panel on the Second World War. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.